I'm going to read with you this morning Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mark. And our uh, New Testament reading this morning is John chapter, from John chapter 19. And if you have a Bible, I, you're welcome to turn there uh, with me as we consider these uh, words together. Um, John chapter 19, starting at verse 1, 1 to 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you, uh, I'm out to, you to let you know that I find no basis for the charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it, not, if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, Crucify, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away. Take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to, to them to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's pray. Gracious Father, as we look at this, these verses from John, which are familiar to many and new to some, but essential for all of us. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, and we pray that your Spirit might descend today upon our hearts and our minds, that you might wean us from the things of earth and all of our impulses move. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to our weakness as strong as you are and teach us to love you as we ought to love you through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, the series they were in just now is called Shadows to Sunrise, John chapter 18 and 19. And John chapter 18 started a chapter ago as the disciples and Jesus were in the Kindron crossing at night in the Kindron Valley. And we've seen the characters and the plot and the events unfold in the darkness as Jesus is leading up to the cross. We've seen uh, Jesus with his disciples in the garden. We've met Malchus, who uh, had his ear chopped off by Peter, and Jesus healing that ear. We've seen Judas, who betrays Jesus. We've seen Peter, who denies Jesus. We've seen the leaders, who are determined to kill Jesus. We've met Pilate, who is in the middle of a relationship back and forth with Jesus. And all of these characters and all of the events are are leading up in this way as we we go with Jesus to the cross, as Jesus is presented, as we understand who Jesus is. And today we come to the last part of the trial of Jesus with Pilate, which is really a mockery of a trial. It's really a a kangaroo court. (laughs) It's happening all quickly and in the night and back and forth. And we see Pilate as a man who's completely agitated. In one verse, he's coming out to meet the leaders. In the next verse, he's going back in to deal with Jesus. And the next verse, he's going out, in, out again to see and then in and out. Five or six times in these verses, Pilate is going back and forth. And he's agitated and he's disturbed. And he's kind of a man that, that, is, that, that is haunted in some way by something in his life. Yet the focus of these sets of verses, the ones from last week and this week, the beginning of John chapter 19, we see a man in Pilate coming as close physically and in conversation with anyone else in the whole story of the cross, coming as close as anyone else to Jesus, interacting as closely as anyone else does with Jesus. And we see in this interaction Jesus Three things about Jesus as he is presented by John in the gospel. We see first the mock coronation for Jesus. We see the silent majesty of Jesus. And we see the punishment pronounced on Jesus. So first we see the mock coronation of Jesus in these first few verses. And I want you to notice with me the cruelty. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, it says. Uh, That's a very strange kind of opening to this chapter uh, because Pilate has just said, remember, by the way, that Jesus is innocent and I find no charge against him. So it's kind of a strange thing that Pilate's doing here, heading out to flog Jesus if he thinks he's innocent. But there's a sense in which Pilate is trying to assuage the crowds who want to crucify him because Pilate believes that Jesus is innocent and has done nothing wrong. And we enter into this time when Pilate has Jesus flogged And kind of this mock, pretend coronation of Jesus. The soldiers twist together a crown of thorns. Maybe they were date palms, 10 or 12 inches long, placing it on his head, and the blood drips down his face. They put a purple robe on him, one that would uh, represent royalty, uh, the hardest fabric, the most expensive kind of fabric to make. Maybe it was a red soldier's um, uh, robe of some kind, but it was something that a, a king ought to wear. And they come up to him like they would a king, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. They, they yell it, but they don't mean it. Of course, they're being sarcastic and cruel and mean to him, calling him as a king as they, as they beat him, as they flog him. The flogging, we know, was a, a, a vicious kind of event where they, they took a, a stick with, with, a, with, 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 with leather on the end and bones or brass on the end of that letter, as they hit, and they would hit him with that, sometimes even down to the very bone. And so here is Jesus, a crown of thorns on his head, flogged in his back, bleeding, A purple robe wrapped around him, meant to present him as important and royal and set aside. Them yelling, hail king of the Jews, making fun of Jesus. And they slap him on his face. His lips are maybe bleeding. His, His cheeks are red. It's a mock, pretend coronation. The one that others are calling a king. 
And then the next verse, verse 4, we see the climax of this coronation. Pilate comes out and, and says to the Jews gathered there and brings Jesus with him. He says, look, I'm bringing this man, Jesus, out to you to let you know again that I find no basis for the charge against him. He is innocent. This Jesus is the most noble man that has ever lived. He's lived the perfectly sinless life. Pilate has realized this, that there's something about Jesus that has set him aside, has set him apart from any other person he's had to interview or put through a trial and condemned to death. Pilate just can't do it as innocent and pure as Jesus is. And so instead, Pilate takes him out to the religious leaders and the crowds in verse 5, and Jesus is there wearing his crown of thorns, the thorns that point us back to Genesis chapter 3 of the meaning of the curse. When Adam is taken out of the garden, the ground shall be cursed and only produce for you, Adam, thorns. And here is Jesus with the thorns in his brow because he will take on the curse that each and every one of us experience and feel as human beings unable to live up to the glory and righteousness of God. And here is Jesus, crowns of thorns, the man of curse, the one with humanity's curse in his brow, on his brow, how heavy that is. If he's taking the sin in my life, it's heavy. If he's taking the sin in your life, maybe it's lighter. <laughs> if he's taking the sin and curse of the whole world on his head, how heavy is his brow? And Pilate says to the crowds in a way to try to assuage them and present Jesus, he says, here is the man. Do you see Jesus this morning? Do you see him as Pilate presents him? Here is the man. Words that in a way, you know, on one level mean look at him, but on another level mean something way more, that here is the man like no other man. Do your, does the sight of Jesus with his crown of thorns and his face beaten and bloodied when your eyes turn to him, here is the man. Is your heart rending at the sight? His ribs exposed, maybe. His lips cut. A man whose appearance is marred more than any other man we read in Isaiah and whose scholars say is perhaps standing there in front of the crowd so beaten that his features are not recognizable. Behold the man. Do you see the man this morning? Does it touch your mind this morning to see what Jesus has done for us? Does it touch your heart? Are your knees weakened in any way? Do you feel anything deep down in your stomach for this, this man who has going to the cross? For all the people in this story, and for everyone who believes in him. C.S. Lewis writes about this little verse in John, <laughs> here is the man, that when we look at Jesus, beaten and bloodied, we see a diagram of the love of God. Well, it's a strange statement, here is the man, because on one hand it means here's the man <laughs> as we see him with our human eyes. But on the other side, as Jesus stands there, his true identity <laughs> is not the one who seems overpowered by evil in the world. His true identity is, is the one of the Son of God, the one of whom we read in Revelation, <laughs> in Revelation 1 and Verse 13, as Jesus stands there, he stands as the eternal Son of God as well. The one whose, whose robe is not dirty and torn, but perfectly royal. In, John, in Revelation that goes down to his feet, whose eyes in Revelation 1 as the Son of Man are blazing like fire. 
not sunken and swollen and, dur- and bloodied and, 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 and bloodshot because he's been beaten so badly. He stands in Revelation as a one with feet like bronze who's unmovable and strong in the face of every trial and difficulty that you face or I face, not the one who was slouched over in John holding on to that post for all his life as the flog, as the whip comes down on him. In Revelation, he's the one who has a voice like rushing water, not here in John, that's one that's dry and can feel so human, the one who's thirsty. He's standing there as the one whose face, says John in Revelation, is like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Behold the man. Can you see the Lord Jesus this morning in what he's done for you and for who he is eternally in power and to the trials and difficulties and pains of your life and my life seem small in the light of his eternal glory, the King. Well, his mock coronation continues on (laughs) very briefly in verse 6. The cruelty, the climax, and the mock coronation has this moment of coercion. In verse 6, as the chief priests and their officials uh, saw Jesus, they see him. Is there a lump in their throat when they see this Jesus bloodied for them? Is there a realization this is the one that Isaiah prophesied? No. Instead, what is their response? Crucify and crucify. And Pilate again says, no, he's innocent. And then we have this bit of coercion at the end of his coronation. In verse 7, the the leaders say forcefully, we have a law, Pilate, and you're in the bad graces of Rome, Pilate. If you mess up one more time, Pilate, we're going to tell them that you don't respect our laws. Pilate, you must do this. You must put to death this man because he's broken our laws. And Pilate, that man who is so troubled going in and out, is haunted in a way by the demons of his past, by the decisions he's made, by the compromises that he's experienced We don't know if Pilate had a father who ever said to him, Pilate, you have to do what's right even if it costs. We don't know if he had a mother who taught him about courage or why he grew up to be such a coward. We don't know why his conscience is so compromised and why he's so tortured inside and unable to live in the ways he wants to live. But here's Pilate now crushed by the forces of the world around him. He is weak. He's unable to live righteously. What a coward. It's how you and I can find ourselves living when things get really hard. Pilate finds himself crushed. By the weight of the world and the forces around him. And so what happens? What do we see? Well, we see in verse 8, the silent majesty of Jesus. Pilate goes back in now, and he's afraid, it says. He goes back into the palace. Uh, He goes back inside for the last time. He's inside this side, maybe inside's over here. He goes back inside the last time. And Pilate has his last private conversation with Jesus, conversations that are changing him. And his last private conversation with Jesus, this intimate conversation with Jesus, is ruled by silence. Pilate asks Jesus three questions, and Jesus doesn't respond to them. It seems like Pilate's in control, but really Jesus is, isn't he? What's the first question, Pilate asks? Where do you come from? Silence. Pilate's asking about his origins. The one who said, Abraham, uh, I, was before, <laughs> I, I was before Abraham. I, I am before Abraham was. I am God. We see that all throughout John. Jesus presented as the eternal son of God, full of grace and truth. No answer. 
Do you refuse to speak to me? The second question Pilate asks him, do you refuse to speak to me? Um, no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? I'm Pilate. I'm powerful, Jesus. Don't you know? I, I, got the, I am the one wearing the purple robes of Rome. I'm the one carrying the authority of the emperor on my head, Pilate. Jesus, don't you know? You refuse to speak to me? <laughs> it's like Naaman in, in 2 Kings when uh, he wants to be healed by the prophet Elijah of his leprosy. And Elisha does what? Does he come out to speak to Naaman, the powerful general? No, he sends his servant to speak to him because Elisha sees something in, in, in Naaman's heart that might be categorized as pride, a lack of humility. And Naaman says, you send your servant to me? Surely I thought, Naaman says to the servant, I surely thought Elisha would come out to me. And so Pilate is proud. And the third question is, don't you realize I have power either free or crucify you? And Jesus, on all these three questions, is silent in his majesty there, and finally gives an answer to Pilate. Pilate, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. All the power is mine, says Jesus. All the glory is mine, says Jesus. All the kingdoms are mine, says Jesus. All the worlds are mine, said Jesus. They've mocked him. Why? Because he's healed the man at Siloam, why? He's fed the 5,000. They've mocked him. Why? Because he, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Pilate, aren't you understanding this? All is mine. The Father has given me power. You would have nothing, Pilate, if it weren't given to you from above. And it's like last week in the verses before, Pilate, my kingdom is not from this, of this world, but is from another Place. He's unaware, Pilate, that Jesus' throne is above this earthly Roman tribunal. That the ways of Rome will crumble. That the glory of Rome will fall away. There'll be people knocking at the doors of Rome in just a few hundred years that thought it would never fall. <laughs> and it does. And Jesus shakes Pilate. The Pilate who, who, who thought he had his life together so perfectly, and now this beaten up Jewish carpenter won't even speak to him, is silent in the face. He goes like a lamb, Jesus does, to the slaughter. There's one little detail in this section I want you to notice that I spent a long time thinking about this week because I couldn't understand it. And it says at the end of verse 11, Therefore, Jesus says to Pilate, The one who handed, over, handed you over to me is guilty of a greater sin. What's Jesus saying there? The way I, I read that is Jesus is talking about Judas, or maybe even the high priest, who, who knew in a way who Jesus was in a, in, in a greater light and background that they would have had in reading the Scriptures and being steeped in the Scriptures. And in a way, this message from Jesus to Pilate, I think there are others who have done worse, who, who have acted out of big true knowledge, and you haven't had the same knowledge. I, I read that as a word from Jesus of comfort to Pilate. For me, it's a word of kindness to Pilate. For me, I think it's even a word of grace. Why do I say that? Well, because Pilate is caught, he's in, he's in kind of trouble here. And Jesus, in, 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 the, in the moment of, of, of Pilate squirming and not sure what's going to happen and feeling the weight of everything coming down upon him, Jesus has a word for him of comfort. Jesus has a word of kindness for Pilate. There are others who have done worse than you, Pilate. What's Jesus saying? I think Jesus is giving Pilate an invitation here that in all of his distraction, that in his hauntedness, that in his, his almost demon-possessed life, Jesus is saying to him at the end, Pilate, will you, will, will you receive a word from me of kindness and comfort? Pilate, will you look to me as your king? 
Pilate, will you look to me as the one not only you've allowed to be beaten, but the one who loves you? One book writes this about how we're to interact with Jesus. Every human friendship has a limit. If we offer, if we offend again, if we re- our relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray enough, we are cast out. The walls go up. With Christ, our sins and weaknesses, however, are the very resume that qualify us to approach him. And we, we see the grace of a Savior speaking to a man who is in such need of forgiveness. Do you find yourself there with Pilate harboring a secret sin this Lent on the way up to the cross? Do you feel yourself like Pilate carrying a burden that maybe you've created out of your own bad decisions? And is the devil lying to you saying you deserve it, there's no way out, you must pay for this, you're worth nothing. Well, Jesus, I think in this passage, wants all the pilots in the world to know that he has power, that he is able, that he can forgive, heal, and restore. Well, we have the mock coronation of Jesus We have the silent majesty of this gracious Savior, the Lamb of God. And then finally we have, in the last verses, the punishment pronounced on Jesus. And that's in verse 12, the punishment pronounced on Jesus. The whole thing's coming to a head. The whole story is coming to a head here. From then on, it says, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. Pilate's made up his mind. This guy has to go free. But he finds that his resolution is breaking down. The Jewish leaders keep shouting, and they play their ace card now with Pilate. The Jewish leaders, they play their ace card. They say, if you let this Jesus go, you're no friend of Caesar. What, is, what are they saying there? That friend of Caesar is this idea of Caesar's favor. Pilate was on rocky ground. He'd messed up three times, remember. There were revolts that he tried to quash and did it very badly. And letters had been written about him to Rome already, how bad a ruler he was. And the emperor of Rome at the time, Caesar, was known to be a a, a guy who really hated disloyalty, was a bit paranoid. He lived at that time on the Isle of Capri, isolated and alone, and was known just to give a sentence of death to someone who wasn't doing very well. And so now the Jews are saying, if you don't do what we say, we will spread the rumor that you're no friend of Caesar. And it says in verse 13, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and he sat Jesus down. And now his mind is made up, isn't it? The vacillation in in Pilate's life, the back and forth in Peter's life, the double-mindedness in um, Pilate's life. What am I looking for at the beginning of the book of James? Where is this in James chapter 1? But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blows and blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And Pilate is here, has brought Jesus out, and he's yielding now. In all of his vacillation, he's realize that he is a double-minded man. And he's vacillated and he's been crushed now by the opinions of the world. And now we see this picture at the end of Pilate out with all of his Roman regalia on. The best-looking governor there is sitting on his judgment seat. And who's before him? (laughs) With another robe on, also purple. The crown of thorns dug into his head, carrying the curse that we deserve. Pilate is staring at the true king and the true judge. And John says, it was the day of Passover in that moment of Jesus being judged by Pilate. 
and receiving the judgment of the world. John says it was the day of preparation, Passover, and it was about noon when that moment of judgment happens, which we know from scholars is the exact time in the temple that the Passover lambs begin to be slaughtered and sacrificed. And Pilate says to the Jews, here is your king. And they, they shout uh, an unbelievably surprising response. We've heard it, but it's kind of the last chance here. They say, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate almost says, is a last chance. And listen to the response here. We have no king but Caesar. That's an amazing statement. In the heritage of having the stories of Abraham and Sarah and Samuel and David passed on, there's a sense of uh, the pressure is so strong. There's a sense of a betrayal of centuries past, of a heritage of faith. Are you being tempted in a way to betray your past? Is there a sense in which the heritage of faith that you've received is being questioned in your own life? Do we ever stand here with the leaders, as we indeed may, and say with them, we have no king except Caesar? And that maybe is the whole point of these verses from this week and last week, the kingship of Jesus Christ the glorious kingship of Jesus, the silent kingship of Jesus, the effective and atoning kingship of Jesus. Who is our king? Who is your king? To say our king is Caesar means that it's not Jesus, it's someone else. It really is a statement, isn't it, of rejection. Well, the very last verse in this section, uh, we get the very end of the trial. We get the very end of the story, for now anyway. We have the Lord Jesus Christ standing there before Pilate, bleeding for you, bleeding for me beaten for you, beaten for me. We have the Lord Jesus standing there before Pilate, a diagram of the love of God, the one who's able to, to absorb all of our weakness and sin, uh, the one who's, one who's able to redeem us and restore us. He's standing there before Pilate. And we can ask ourselves, as Jesus is standing there, as the king before Pilate, as this story has unfolded, do we, do we find ourselves in this story like the disciples in the garden who, who have fled Christ? Do we find ourselves like Judas who, is, who has gone through such an existential crisis in his life that he's chosen money over the way of Christ? Do I find ourselves in the darkness and in the shadows of these stories before the sunrise? with Peter by the fire, saying we don't never knew that man? Do we find ourselves in the shadows with Pilate, searching, wondering, unsure, vacillating, without courage, cowardly? However we may find ourselves standing before Pilate, we are standing there in the Lord Jesus is present and able. And this story ends with Rome in all of its authority, the world in all of its quote-unquote power, facing the one who is full of power, the one who is truth. And it's the very crux of John chapter 18 and 19. Pilate, it says, handed him over to them to be crucified. And what scholars tell us, uh, what a Roman 
official would say at this time a standard phrase. They would say out loud, Ebus in crucem. So that all can hear, Ebus in crucem. So that all can hear as they, he says it to Jesus, the true king, the Lord of lords, Ebus in crucem. On the cross, you will die. Let's pray. How we thank you, Father, for the kindness of Jesus. How we thank you for the goodness of Jesus. How we thank you for the power of Jesus. Forgive us for the ways in which we fail him every day. And Lord, no matter where each of us is on our spiritual journey, whether we're here in church for the first time, whether we're questioning and doubting things that we've heard in the past, whether we're in a place of flourishing, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would know afresh the person and presence of the suffering, died, and risen Lord Jesus, who loves us with a love that never will fail. Amen.